just uh, uh, continue. Um, so this is going to be um, uh, both an introduction to the work of the water information subject, uh, the motivation for the workshop, and a little bit of a showcase of the center's work as well. So uh, the title of the talk, of course, is, is Water Informatics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little, uh, uh, talk a little bit about the tools and technology. Now, the bulk of the tool is not going to be about these things. Uh, the bulk of the tool is about data analytics, system analysis, uh, processing data. But I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview about what happens behind the scenes uh, in collecting data in sort of uh, various enabling technologies. That has actually gotten us to the point where we are beginning to talk about uh, these, uh, uh, these very exciting data analytics and technologies as well. So this is a little bit of a perspective of an electrical engineer. How uh, this very prediction sort of uh, field of electrical engineering are contributing to our also, I would, uh, I would try to make a case and uh, give you a description of why I think that the water issue or the water problem or the water setting in Pakistan in particular is the most high in my mind. The debate with that right is the most and the most important and the most challenging uh, of all the various developmental problems and, uh, and that challenges that, that, this, that this particular nation is And this is more than even that. Uh, people from outside of the traditional disciplines <laughs> into the water area and agriculture area and start to look at uh, the issue. So uh, this is going to be the uh, outline of my talk. First of all, I will introduce you to the setting because uh, when we talk about water, well, what is it? What is so special about Pakistan? What is so special about the Indus Basin as well? So I'll try to make a case of why we should take a look at that, and then we we'll talk a little bit about the promise of bringing these smart technologies and marrying them to the, to the traditional infrastructure, water infrastructure and agricultural infrastructure. And really the question is that what we introduce these new things, um, uh, saying it like maybe can electronic this to a hydraulic site? This is, this, is, this is sort of a provocative question. And then what we do is that we look through two particular cases. Uh, first of all, a, a very long-term sort of uh, engagement with the, uh, with the government where we have helped with the Yabi Education Department, of, of course, with uh, some uh, support of the technology as an example of academia and uh, 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 government interaction. And then another uh, case, major case uh, study would be uh, our collaboration with NSA, which I would try to give you some examples of how uh, academia can help industry to uh, improve on its business uh, and how can we scale up these things. Uh, based on why it's not only just the corporate farmer and the investment farmer, but also the small farmer. Uh, and uh, again, with the uh, government as well, not only just for the irrigation department, but for other government agencies, small or big and partner organizations, and, and so on and so forth. And finally, making the case for the okay. uh, Now, this picture is uh, in the Indus Basin. This is uh, our country. Uh, this is the five rivers. Uh, this is the river Indus, which is all the big rivers there are to this, 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 this one river system. And it's a very unique situation in the world where uh, the Gidea, the Himalaya, from where the, the snow, uh, via the snow belt, most of the water is going through the river and ending up into the sea. And this is why this one has the river case. And this is a satellite image of the country. And as you can see, that uh, all the green parts. Uh, are where agriculture is, of course, and all of the population is also living just, uh, just, just along this river. So uh, really, the, the the lifeline of the of, of the country is this river system, where most of the population is, which is in, in agriculture, and agriculture in turn is dependent on water, which is coming from the uh, most, mostly coming from these glaciers, and and part of it is is, is supported by the moss. So it's an arid country, as you can see, and we are heavily dependent on uh, on water from from these sources. Now. I wanted to make a little bit of a case that these river basins, these are very complex system of systems. And when you talk about system analysis, I think nothing could be a better, a, a, a better example of what sort of complexities that we encounter in dealing with these uh, or managing with these very, very large complex systems. So just to let you appreciate, this is just a material representation of just the physical element. So we are just talking about uh, the, the, again, that uh, Victorian is speaking, the mountains, the glaciers, the rivers, and the ground is the uh, atmosphere, the ground table, and so on and so forth. So it is really some sort of a task between the three physical elements, soil, uh, and water, uh, which is just the physical complexity. But let's not forget um, 
that this, this basin is also uh, connected to the people. So there are people living on there. The, it's, 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 a, it's a cultural complexity of the people interacting with the basin that adds to the complexity. So not just the physical complexity, but really the institutions and how people are using water, how people are allocating water. And that actually makes it quite a complex system to look at. And again, just to let you appreciate that complexity, uh, if, if you go from the physical picture, if I take just one piece out of it, just one small piece out of it, because I'm not talking about glaciers at the moment, I'm not talking about groundwater, I'm not only going to talk about the, uh, the surface water. For, for, for this particular example. And if I just take this one particular piece out of it, in Pakistan, that little piece by itself is the largest irrigation system in the world. The largest contiguous irrigation system in the world, which is over 90,000 kilometers of water courses, I mean, multiple garages, canal over 40 million uh, acres of, uh, of irrigated land. I mean, that by itself is a monster to take a look at. I mean, what to say about the rest of it? And what to say about uh, the other parts where we we are just looking at this so-called piping diagram or a plumbing diagram of the, of the irrigation network, and all of these factors are coming in. Um, and just to remind our, uh, uh, our guests and, and from you as well, this is really 45% of the employment of the 200 million population country is attached to, 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 to this plumbing diagram, if you want to call it, and 25% of GDP is being generated in Parliament. So I think the, the enormity of this all is it's only in this region where, 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 you, where you can find it, which makes uh, it, it very, very important to take a look at uh, this particular system. Now, what are the challenges? Uh, I think all of us uh, they are really very well uh, aware of what, what, uh, what's happening in this system. Uh, we have the climate change kicking in. I mean, the, the rain outside is happening right now. So unusual for this, uh, for this time of the year. I mean, I wasn't expecting that on a, on a May, late May, early June sort of morning you would come and see the, the, this, this sort of thing. Very, very, very unusual. But then we have long dry spells and then we have uh, these, these sort of uh, local incidents, uh, 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 precipitation incidents as well. So that is it's not just a fantasy, it is actually happening at the moment. And um, then we have the population explosion. I mean, if you just drive outside of law, or maybe it does not uh, um, uh, surprise you because we are living here, but after our foreign uh, yes, I mean, they, you are just startled by the density of how many people that you see around. So really the population is really good. And that is actually putting pressure on the people. Uh, urbanization, of course, so the people are moving from uh, agricultural areas, uh, uh, rural areas, into, into the city looking for employment. And then in the middle of all this is, I mean, the world is changing. All uh, the new technologies are emerging which are changing our ways of behavior, our uh, lifestyles, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, we are we are participating. We are in the middle of it all. The geopolitics is the context. So um, uh, now, explaining only just a little bit about the irrigation network itself, because that may be a little bit uh, interesting when, when, when I when I discuss few cases down the road. I mean, these, these in this line diagram, these are the main rivers, uh, the blue ones, and from the from the main rivers out of the reservoirs are these uh, these big canals. Some of these are strange canals because they are actually diverting uh, water from one river to the other, and most of you would know why. But uh, for our for our guests, I mean, this is because of the accord that we have with India, where half of the rivers at the time of the partition, uh, they have the eastern rivers, uh, uh, India gets to keep, and the western rivers we get to keep. Um, and from the canals themselves, these are the canal commands. There are these branching. Um, for example, from the main canal comes these uh, the secondary canals, and then from the secondary canal comes these distributaries, and from the distributaries these uh, so this, is, this is really like a, like a very, very complex network, branching after branching after branching. And just to um, uh, let you appreciate the sort of uh, managerial complexity, I mean, at the river level, uh, you have these international treaties, where, for example, between India and Pakistan, and at the moment there is no treaty between uh, pa uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan over the over the Kabul River, but nevertheless, that's a, yeah, that, that's a transboundary uh, sort of issue there. And then, in, in fact, between the provinces, I mean, I, I'm not showing any provincial boundaries here, but that, all of us know, is a hot issue. So how do you divide water between the provinces? This is where the uh, uh, regulation body comes in, which is the Indus River uh, System Authority. And then when you go within the canals, then, then the irrigation department takes care of it. There, there, there are these feeder bodies, so to, so to speak, at some places, but then the irrigation department also takes care of things, and so on and so forth. So at each level, there are these multiple ways of, uh, of doing management. Uh, these hierarchies, they are sort of interacting with each other. That uh, 
once once again from purely from an engineering com, uh, point of view, this is not just a matter of releasing gates at one place or the other. Even there, there's the whole sort of uh, social complexity enters into this. Okay, and in fact, this is what I I, I just said. But if you look at the total system, it's not just the hydrology, not just the surface water and the groundwater that I that I talked about. It is really this social network which is interacting or coupling very very strongly with the hydrology. And that makes it a very, very exciting uh, social technical system to, uh, to take a look at. Because uh, here you, you may have an engineer's eye or a physicist's eye where you want to just look at, uh, focus on the partial differential equations governing the uh, proliferation of groundwater downstairs. But um, it's really coupled by how the, the, the policy making is, is happening and how the end users are behaving and, 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 and so on and so forth. So these feedback groups are really, really important how human behavior is affecting water resources, and in turn, the water resources are affecting uh, uh, human, human resources as well. And uh, in this um, uh, setting, when I say it is very, very exciting, in a different setting, I would say that's very, very depressing. Because to the end user, to the farmer, I mean, uh, and to the government officials, I mean, this sort of complexity is a nightmare to, to really deal with. But I think in this community, but when, 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 as, a, as an academic, if you're looking for a problem to work on and, and, and if you're looking for a challenge to be thrown at you, well, that same nightmare is actually your dream. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the dream system, the system complexity that you want to spend your life tackling and proposing solutions and uh, dealing with fancy math and so on and so forth. So, I, I mean, I, 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 I want to present this both as an opportunity and as a, as a challenge. An opportunity for us academics, but of course, big challenge because uh, all of us are tied to the basin and the sustainability. Okay. Now, and here I raise the question, well, okay, if we already have this, this, this really great physical complexity, now what can new technologies, these water informatics technologies, they can, they can, they can bring to the picture? Uh, the provocative part of the question that can electronics rescue a hydraulic society? I mean, already our society is molded by and governed by the, by the hydraulic software, but now we are bringing in these new gadgets, what, 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 what can they do for you? First of all, I will list a few Key, key areas, uh, not to say that this is an exhaustive list, but maybe these, these are things that, that, that at least our water bonding managers have not really thought about too much. So things like, for example, a new sensing technologies and internet of things. Uh, robotics and automation. I mean, this is not uh, something which is happening just in the West or these uh, Google self-driving cars which are, which are being introduced. Uh, even our agriculture sector would one day can benefit from, from, from these things. And I, I will actually show you one, one concrete example of that. Computer vision, machine learning like tools, well, okay, so there's, there's an excitement about these big data analytics and so on and so forth. But well, what can that do for the water sector or the agriculture sector? Wireless networks, wireless communication technologies, uh, and, and of course data analytics and systems analysis, the bulk of our course. I mean, when, when, you, when you collect data using all of these technologies, then, then you can do uh, throw a lot of fancy math at it to, to, uh, uh, to acquire a lot of intelligence. And uh, I, uh, I'm very excited to talk about this in this audience because I've learned that many of you are actually electrical engineers and computer scientists in this in, in, in this in this, in this room. And uh, for you to be uh, sitting in a water-related event and talking about these technologies, maybe you can, you can generate new ideas for you. And if you can imagine, and if you can imagine that someday that this would be done, that someday we'd be able to create this so-called smart water grid in which the physical elements, the rivers, the water courses, the barrages, the wells, the gates, and the pumps, they would be interacting with these cyber elements, so to speak, uh, sensors and controllers and communication services and intelligent algorithms and system analysis tools and so on and so forth. Well, so that would be a network smart or water grid or a cyber physical system or an internet of things or however you want to say it. So I'm, I'm throwing these, 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 some of these uh, uh, catchy sort of phrases because that's the jargon which is being used in the ICT community at the time. And for those of you who are from the water sector, at least you should be aware of what's, what, what, what's happening in that, in that, that other world. And then if well, you can now stretch your imagination. Well, what can be done? If we are able to uh, acquire these sort of technologies and deploy them, well, maybe for the same system that I showed you, which is prone by a lot of inefficiencies, well, maybe you can increase the uh, distribution and the system. Maybe you can start to think about demand-based delivery. Um, those who are from the water sector would immediately be alerted by this because I mean, this is a very, very sort of different concept from irrigation delivery uh, as we are uh, 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 practicing right now. Uh, control of non-technical losses, in plain terms, just water theft or just uh, diversions or just uh, non-elevated sort of uh, usage of water. Maybe you can have good checks on those. So 
person has monetary inflatory security and so on and so forth. I mean, immediately these sort of things come to your mind. Now, if I had been showing this slide about 10 years back, saying, well, um, I mean, these are the things that possibly one, one day can happen, I would have just stopped there. And we actually have done a little bit towards exploring these ideas and putting these things on the ground and, and, and looking at what can be achieved. So what I'll do now is show you a few examples of where we have actually done some of this. And some of this has been put on, uh, on the ground and what have we been able to achieve. Now, starting with our relationship with the government. With the government. So I, I said at the beginning that I will show you two examples. Uh, a collaboration with the, with the government, how um, uh, an academic institution like us or a center can help government uh, sort of prototype different ideas and then with the industry. So starting with the government, uh, the Punjab Education Department actually spends a lot of time and its uh, energy on uh, uh, monitoring infrastructure. What does it mean? That for the same sort of irrigation network where you have these thousands of channels to, to uh, take a look at, well, there is a whole army of, of, of irrigation managers and bailers and, and gauge readers and so on and so forth who, well, wake up every morning at 8 a.m. they look at their gauges <coughs> to report that, what, what was going on in the, in the river or in the, in, in the canal. And the irrigation department it, 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 it creates a situation of what's, uh, of what's going on. And, 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 and uh, by the way, I must give credit to them that they are doing a pretty very good job uh, at this. But, uh, but, but at a resolution and at a, at a frequency that probably is, uh, is a little bit unacceptable. Now, this is where we came in and then we started to uh, uh, propose to the irrigation department, well, you can think about real-time flow monitoring systems. And this was about a decade back that we started to have these sort of conversations. And uh, at that time, it was not really clear to them that what sort of particular technology that should be. Deployed there. This is an off-the-shelf technology which is available, uh, two-decade-old or three-decade-old technology which is uh, available in the in, in the world. But really, how should it be packaged and scaled up to the extent that we have in, in this basin was something that was uh, pretty much up in the air. So we actually prototyped the whole thing uh, about uh, five years back, uh, starting with the BSC thesis, uh, final year project, uh, believe it or not, that worked for 15 minutes on a bench and uh, scaling it up. Uh, about uh, half a decade of work, taking it to the field and, and, and deploying it on uh, on, uh, on, on, on many real places. So this is the setting. You have the irrigation channel. Uh, right next to the irrigation channel is what is known as a sailing well. Uh, so whatever the level of water in the canal or, or the well is, the same level is inside the well. Now, it, 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 within the well, we, we, we install this little gadget that we have, we have made, uh, a wireless sensor board or, a, uh, or an internet of things like device that actually takes a look at the level using ultrasonic, uh, measures this, uh, this level, and then transmits it via a DSM or a, some, some other wireless network technology back to a server which may be sitting there in the hall or in the, the, in, in the, in the irrigation network, uh, irrigation department network. So simple enough. Uh, we actually did this, uh, this installation, a pilot project in 2013-14, uh, in the Bahawal area. Uh, so again, if you refer to the same map, the southern Punjab area, bordering uh, in, uh, India. Um, and this is the so-called Hakra uh, branch uh, canal command area. Out of this main branch canal, there are about 17 distributaries. Uh, and on each of these distributaries, we install these sensors. So this is one of the uh, sites where we, we install. This is, this is the scaling well that I was talking to you about. This is the lid open, and then you can see the, the sensor box inside. And then for a full year, we were able to make these measurements at a 10 minute uh, interval. We I mean, could have done it at a one second interval as well, but I think that makes absolutely no sense for the irrigation because the dynamics are actually very slow. Now imagine the, the leap that we are having from a uh, once in a day sort of measurement to a 10 minute uh, resolution um, uh, uh, situation analysis for the same network. That uh, and, 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 and getting the picture in real time with a sort of minimal delay. So we we built the software back end and we, uh, sort of a little bit of a dashboard where all of this data was used this way. Um, these are again some of the examples of the installation in Bahawalnagar area, uh, southern Punjab, where this happened. And again, just just a blow up of the uh, the dashboard and. And then, uh, so this, this is one situation where one, one, uh, uh, one day, this is 22nd of April 2014, uh, around 6 p.m., well, this is what all the channels are doing. But then, of course, you are collecting all of this data, you can begin to explore historical trends, but what has been going on in the system? 
for the last, if you've collected data from one year or from one season, what, 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 what has been going on in, in, in this system? And that actually is just uh, a start of a very, very interesting exploration on what the whole system is doing. So it, it, it just lets you jump from this just merely a collection sort of a, 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 a sort of a routine to a whole sort of area of investigation into what, 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 what the whole system and the whole network is doing. Uh, we, we started to do uh, uh, many of those things. These, these are just some, uh, um, uh, you can say, aspects of what the installation was like. Uh, and also a little bit of a reassuring that we actually spent a lot of time in the calibration and actually making sure that the measurements that we were doing were actually what were on the ground and how we were, uh, the flow measurements that we were, uh, uh, that we were deriving were actually the, the right ones. But the, but, the, but the thing that I now want your attention to is, and where all of this informatics actually starts to come in is, that this is just one snapshot of a year-long measurement of what was happening in that canal command area throughout the year. And we have now about 17 of these, and this is a district level sort of installation, uh, a major area, about 1% of the whole uh, water budget of Pakistan is now being monitored at a 10 minute sort of resolution. Well, you can do a lot with, uh, with, with this sort of data. Uh, this, this sort of hydrograph, as, as, as you can look at, uh, uh, you will see that curiously it has been labeled uh, red, blue, and, and, and green in this list. What, what I'm trying to indicate here is that then we sat down with the irrigation people, and then we got these so-called irrigation rosters from them. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, it's a water stress country, so what happens is that within the irrigation network, you do a little bit of rationing by which you open and close the canals on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. So you don't give everybody water on every, every, every day of the week because water is, is, is in scarcity. So you, um, uh, you release a sort of a schedule at the start of the season saying that, okay, day number one, you will get water. From day number one to day number seven, you will get water. Day number eight to day number 14, the second uh, canal will get water and so on and so forth. And, and then you go in a rotation so that by the end of the a season, everybody gets uh, gets a full share. But how do you know that 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 that, that the full share has been has been delivered? So this is what has been attempted here. Uh, what we uh, began to do was that we took those schedules from the irrigation department and then we overlaid them over these measurements to indicate that well, green is when you were supposed to get water uh, in, in on a particular day of time, and were you actually getting getting your share of water? And red is the time of the year when you were not supposed to get uh, get water. And if there is a water level which is red, but 17 is the highest, that actually means that there is some sort of violation. I mean, think of the infinite possibilities now that begin to emerge from this, that instead of sort of a very sort of open loop analysis of what's happening, and just uh, and getting a picture of what is happening in real time, you're now beginning to even analyze the operation on a long term, and uh, sort of assessing the uh, uh, capability of the uh, irrigation department to, to, to deliver over a long period. So um, uh, we then uh, got their measurements as well, their, their manual measurements. Again, they are doing excellent work of collecting daily measurements for the entire network, all of the branch canals, all of the uh, uh, miners, and, and the, uh, as well as all the system. And then we, 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 are, we are looking at uh, other sort of issues, like for example, this is the main discharge of the head, at, at the head of the canal, uh, which is uh, 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 providing supply to all the 17 uh, distributaries. And then maybe what is happening in the main system is affecting what is happening downstairs. So it's trying to look at what is happening at the river river level and then trying to figure out that how does um, uh, operation at a, at a large scale affects operation really at the micro scale, a sort of a minute by minute thing. That actually now starts to um, uh, become possible. So this again is a, is a glimpse of those animation rosters, those Barabandi rosters that I was talking to you about, and uh, this, this is a schedule which is issued by the uh, by the department, and then we just sort of converted them. And then this, this was one of our uh, sort of uh, little findings in which we did the area under the curve for the, for the hydrograph to find the total volume, and then we are beginning to compare, well, there is this particular area which is getting this much water or volume of water throughout the season, as compared to, for example, this area where it is getting this, this, this one. Now, there may be good hydrological reasons for why this is happening. But a farmer living in this area can now begin to maybe, maybe at, least, at least raise a question of, well, why is this area getting this much water and this area getting this much water? And why, why is there a difference? And that actually leads to all sorts of questions about these feedback between the social networks and the hydrology. So uh, you can see now that how the 
it's sort of hydrological merging, it's, 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 it's helping us to pose questions about the social network uh, as well. Again, this is uh, another blow up of uh, the same sort of, uh, I would say, social hydrology minute by minute uh, to, uh, to borrow a title from, uh, from Jim Westcott, who, who I just had a pleasure of visiting. Uh, we are overlaying here those, again, those very, very fine measurements by the measurements which are reported by the irrigation department. And, and so first, there are, there are many things to observe here. First of all, those daily measurements which are these red dots, they are agreeing more or less with what is happening on uh, uh, reported by our census. So that tells us that, okay, what we are measuring is it's not bogus. I mean, there is there, there, something going on here. What, what, what is really going on here? I mean, uh, once the measurements, they go to a maximum level, these further uh, variations, they're not being reported. So what, what's really going on? Uh, is this because uh, the irrigation department does not like to report these, these further fluctuations? Or is this because the gauge reader does not have the capability to uh, actually go beyond a certain this, this maximum range and then then uh, d uh, differentiate between a, a very high flow and a very, very, very high flow, or something like that? Or maybe once the canal has been opened and then the gauge reader just just simply just sends the, the, the standard measurement every day without looking very carefully at what, what, what's going on. I, I, I'm not uh, giving you answer on any of this, but you can see all of that, all of that behavior now within this. Give you a further example. Now, this is one of those uh, uh, measurements and our flows now zoomed in, further zoomed in. You can very clearly see here now that in the, in the morning when the gates are opened, the, 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 uh, the, the flow it tries to reach a certain point. And then it drops, and then it reaches a certain point where it drops. This tells you that the gate gate opener is actually either trying to make up from what, what was happening last night, or if our uh, if, if there is really a difference between our gauges and their gauges, maybe there is something happening during the day which is not being reported. So there is uh, either there is an issue of transparency or there is an issue of interpretation. And I, this raises all sorts of questions about what is happening, which is not possible to interpret from just a daily budget. I mean, we're really we are looking at a minute by minute sort of equation. I'm not raising any question, uh, sort of uh, questions or, uh, uh, or controversies here about operations, because really we don't know uh, what, what was happening downstairs. But this, this, I mean, this sort of research actually opens up a whole exciting domain of how people are behaving on the canals, on the uh, on, 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 on site with the resources and how things are being reported as you as you sit here in the hall just looking at the big picture. Uh, then these these sort of measurements actually have helped us to go into many, many directions as well. So for example, we have done a lot of work which I will not talk about today in building models. Uh, building a lot of little systems and signals uh, language, if uh, those of you who are from lexical engineering here, uh, little drafts of functions of uh, if you open the gate here, then what happens at, uh, at, at the gate? So uh, really these, uh, these model abstractions and so on and so forth. There is a whole series of papers that we have, we have written there uh, about it. And also we have used these, these, uh, these measurements to build models and to actually justify our models. Uh, for example, doing filterings and uh, to, uh, to, to justify to ourselves, well, what, what, what the ultrasound returns was real or false, what the, what the pipe blockage is, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, there is, there's a lot of very smart science that you can do with these, these measurements, marrying the data and the models and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, moving on, uh, that's not the only thing that you can do. Well, you can do even, even more fancy things. So in another project that we, uh, which, is, uh, which is not on the ground in the sense that it is not being deployed in, uh, in, 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 in any of the, um, uh, of the integration regions, but really from an academic perspective, we, we are looking at aerial mapping of, uh, of these uh, integration canals purely from the point of view of finding out siltation deposition. So these, uh, these waters that we, are, uh, that we are having from the rivers, they are very, very uh, silt loaded. And that silt that deposits in the canals uh, as, as, as the operation goes about. And every year we have to close the canals every, uh, uh, in, in the January to, to just dig out the silt. It's not as multiply as you probably would ever know about that. And then uh, we have a collaboration with the German University we have just finished a three or four year project in which we have built a, uh, a drone based system which goes along the length of the canal and look, look at these sort of uh, filtration deposits and uh, uh, gives an estimate of well, what, are, what are the places in the canal where, where, where cleaning has to take place. Again, I mean, this, is a, this is an example of an exciting technology, uh, not a remote sensing technology, but a drone based uh, near sensing, I would say, technology that can help in, uh, in, in a real, a real operational issue. 
like the other television department. So we, we did a bunch of bunch of machine learning stuff to to model the, the whole problem, build lab prototypes, and so on and so forth. Uh, we recreated environments, canal environments in computer simulation. Uh, then uh, a couple of my graduate students they they, they worked on computer vision algorithms to guide the robot by itself. You know, it, it, like a, uh, a 10 mile long canal, I mean, you cannot really operate it by, by hand. The drone has to actually follow the canal by itself. And so you, you, it's some sort of a self-driving drone that you have to build, and we actually build uh, much of that. Okay, so, so that in some sense is, a, is, is an overview of a collaboration with the irrigation department. I'm not touching about everything that we have done together. Just giving you snippets of both what was very, very practical to the irrigation department to an extreme example of what is, a, what is out there. Maybe, maybe these drones will be deployed in five years or ten years. They will be running around and, and, and making measurements. So piloting of some technologies, doing some real demonstrations. So in the Bahamalaga area, I've, 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 I've already mentioned, but uh, nearby uh, in campus in Lahore area, we have, we have done another solution for them. Uh, what it has done is that for the irrigation department, they were actually so excited by this and they were reassured by uh, the, the research that they showed you that they have now decided to do uh, uh, a, a, a province-wide de uh, deployment of these uh, RDMS uh, systems. And already about 200 points uh, um, of these <coughs> have been commissioned uh, this year and next and uh, ultimately they want to do about 3,500 points. The, the, the actual sort of need for uh, instrumentation is much beyond this, tens of thousands of places where you need to uh, install these sort of things. Uh, we have been giving a lot of input to formulating the water policy, uh, giving input on water informatics, and, and, and so on and so forth. So we have we've had a very sort of a successful relationship with the irrigation department, again, piloting some very, very sort of applied things for them, but I'm also looking out uh, into the future and, and helping them uh, think about it. Now, as a second example, very, very quickly, uh, I will tell you about the potential of what industry can do uh, as, as a collaborator with an academic institution like us in sort of thinking about these new technologies. So I'll, 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 I'll uh, give you an overview of, of our industry affiliate program, of which Nestle is our first partner. So uh, the highlights has been, uh, in fact, instead of just going through all of this, let me just give you, uh, take you on a pictorial sort of uh, journey of this. We started this collaboration about a couple of years back where Nestle gave us a little bit of funding and then we, in return, uh, promised them to do a few things. Uh, and the starting point here is that, of course, Nestle, as you know, is a, is a, is a big dairy uh, 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 vendor and uh, uh, the, one of the biggest suppliers of dairy and food industry in Pakistan. And they have their dairy farm, and this is one of their model farms in Nepal. And I'm, I'm just making this little uh, sort of a, a garden of how uh, how they are doing their operation. So at the center of it is, of course, the dairy farm, where they, where they keep the animals. And for every animal which is there, they have about two acres of crop field, which is dedicated to providing water to the uh, uh, to, to, to the animals. So uh, so, th so this is this is the, uh, the 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 heart of the operation. Of course, to, uh, to, to run this farm, uh, they need to divert water uh, from the canals or from the groundwater. And uh, then there, there is a bit of interaction going on there that the, uh, the, the, from the crop fields, this is used as feed for, for, for the animals. And maybe, maybe uh, the output of the animals can be used in turn to, uh, to, uh, to use as nutrients in the field as well. And then um, at this time, Tesla begins to wonder, well, we have this farm here, and then we're using electricity here. Well, what if we try to um, uh, uh, install some sort of biogas reactor to, to maybe somehow balance between uh, the, the grid electricity and, and the potential that we have here? Because I mean, these animals are producing a lot of sweat, so instead of just throwing it away uh, or maybe diverting some of it to the field, maybe we can use, use it, some of it here into the bio, uh, biogas reactor and in, in turn do some sort of optimization. By the way, the rest of the cartoon, there is this little road that uh, that just indicates that from the dairy farm, the milk trucks are now taking this to the milk, milk, uh, milk plant as well. So that part of the operation, I will shortly talk about as well, the whole milk, uh, milk, milk collection business. Now, at this stage, well, we will be coming and we say, okay, let's, let, let, let us try to help you in thinking about this. That how can you actually um, uh, maybe make, make use of or think about how much of this slurry uh, 
uh, is being produced, which is which will be good enough to, to to power your biogas reactor, so that you can have some sort of an optimal optimization between the grid electricity and the biogas. Okay. And this is again, once again, those the, the list of technologies that I that I showed you. So we threw a whole bunch of these things at, at just this model form. And I'll, I'll just walk you through a case by case example by example of what we have to show. This is not, this is a project which is still in the in the making. So this is not finished work, uh, but but things that we are sort of in the middle, but some of it we have, we have already sort of well in all of our So first of all, well those same instruments that you saw for our irrigation monitoring, well you have the sensor box and the whole sensor network idea ready. Well, you, you, you equip it with a different sensor and in a different situation, you can use that to monitor the slurry which is coming out. So this is their slurry pond, and uh, the same sensor is now being installed there in front of the pond, and that is actually now telling you uh, well, when, the, when they turn on their pumps and how the slurry, slurry is coming in, and from this you can calculate in real time how much slurry is the pond producing. So this at least can help their, uh, their daily farm managers to, to, to get an idea of what sort of production are they actually really looking at if you want to operate the biogas uh, yeah, yeah, selector. And then in, in, uh, in parallel, in the crop fields, uh, if you want to increase productivity of, of the crop fields for the, uh, for, 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 for the animals, uh, we have actually just recently helped them install a few moisture sensors and other these uh, precision agricultural life equipment in the crop fields. So that uh, uh, not only at the same time they can uh, they can think about the whole system, but they can also pilot a few 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 new, new things uh, under uh, in, 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 in the whole thing. And then because uh, uh, we have again the, the instruments ready, we can also calculate for them well how much of water is actually flowing through these little channels which uh, by which they are diverting water from the canal. So so making a little modification of again the same same principle that we use in the big canals, we have used it for these little channels as well. Now this, as you will, uh, many of you will recognize, especially coming from the water agriculture area, these are these flume-like structures, uh, very very. Uh, difficult to uh, to manage and uh, and much more problematic to to instrument than than the big canals. But 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 we, we have actually made quite a bit of progress towards uh, uh, again reconfiguring the same technology towards uh, uh, the, the, the small flows as well. So 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 this is where again in the cartoon now I start to populate all of this form using this so the IOTs these Internet of Things. Uh, sort, sort, sort of there, there goes in slurry, measuring the slurry and measuring the water and measuring the, uh, the, the moisture in the field and so on and so forth and then using these wireless networks to transmit all of this information back to the server. Okay? So while all of a sudden this form is beginning to look a lot fancier than, 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 than what it used to be. And then, well, we, we are pretty familiar with our drones flying by irrigation canal channels looking at situation. Why can't we just use that, those same sort of drones to look at the, the fields and, and look at what's happening on the fields. I mean, this is now an all, sort of an off-the-shelf technology on this So one of our uh, faculty associates here, Ahmad Kumar Nasir, uh, I don't know if you, you will be able to meet him during this uh, particular event, uh, he supplies these drones. So we take these drones to the Nestle farms and then show them how to do it. I mean, you can, you can, uh, um, uh, you can go there, uh, program the drone, uh, fly it, it will fly around, it will collect data about what's happening. I mean, this is, you don't need a fancy satellite to do, uh, do all of this. Your, your, your $5,000 drone can also provide a lot of useful information for you. And again, within all of this, I mean, these, these pictures are telling more than what, what catches the eye. Well, you know who, who this guy is? This is a farmer right next door. This is not a nested farmer. There's a farmer which is right next door who just come in and just begin to wonder, well, if Nestle can fly drones over their farm, well, I can do that too. And this is how technology is going to sort of just proliferate. So when, when we are working with an organization like Nestle or helping our irrigation department, not just these industry people that we are, uh, that we are uh, helping out, but, but really we are looking at some big scale changes to how, how, how things are uh, going to uh, operate. Again, okay, in the garden now, okay, all of a sudden these advanced robotics and computer vision like technologies, and then we have these drones making these MTK maps over the field, and this, this is also now possible. Okay? Uh, I think the only place now left is this, this live plant, which, which by itself is a pretty pretty complex uh, operation by itself, but what, what, what can we do here? And then in one of these summer schools, we did a little poster session, and one of the Nestle people, he walks up to one of my PhD students. 
who is doing a project in robotics and says, well, you are looking at road safety as your part of your project, because we are facing the exact same problem in transportation of our milk to our, uh, 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 from our milk collection centers, between our milk collection centers and the factories and the, and, and the farm. Why don't we help us? And Nestle uh, has a big operation about uh, 400 trucks, 1,000 drivers and 280 people move. And they are actually a real problem where there are a number of incidents and a number of fatalities which they are, they are, they are dead serious about, about dealing with. And uh, uh, in, in, in minimizing, of course, their uh, 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 risk to their uh, their street, but also to the general public, and, and of course, protecting their brand as well. And they already train their drivers in making these route hazard maps uh, to to guide how the you should be careful at this particular point. There will be a school there, there's the congested area, and so on and so forth. And then my PhD student is exactly working on this sort of a thing, not thinking that this thing will be used ultimately for you know in a, in a milk dairy business in Pakistan. So we actually prototype for them a little self-driving car. This is not a self-driving car that drives by itself. It just collects data. Uh, we have all the sensors that you would find on the Google car. The latest camera is there, the, the GPS and the IMU. What it does is that it looks ahead. It looks it measures the corridor of the uh, uh, of the road. It uh, by a camera that looks at the congestion, how many people it can detect. These are all off the shelf technologies now. Almost uh, I would say that you can just buy it off the shelf. And then so, uh, we can we can actually build a little dashboard for them that builds this this route hazard map for them automatically. So the same thing that we were doing manually, now we can do it once. Now once again coming back to that that same situation, I mean that that uh, that one thousand year old way or five thousand years old way of doing agriculture, all of a sudden is being proliferated by all of the things that I mentioned to you, the IoT and the wireless networks and the computer vision and the, and the robotics and so on and so forth. And then this final piece of where now the data is being generated for one farm. And then what would happen if all of the Nestle farms are going to be um, uh, instrumented the same way? And then Dr. Afin Siddiqui and uh, Dr. Elena will have a field day of analyzing the systems, the repercussion of, uh, of, 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 of the slurry output of 1,000 farms in Pakistan and so on and so forth. So, so this is really the power. Of, of, of starting small with these little ideas but combining them together in a particular setting where our expertise actually complements with their expertise. So we, they, they, they have things that, that they know that we don't know. They have the knowledge of agronomy and of what's happening down uh, down there, but they don't have the knowledge of the domain, the domain knowledge of using these technologies. How do you actually marry these together? So this in my mind is really the give and take of our affiliate program where an industry like Nestle and can the other organizations as well, big or small, they can they can collaborate with us and then we, 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 can, we can go through uh, what what uh, what we can learn from each other. And, and again, I will not uh, go through this list already I've uh, uh, talked to you about. There is there is a lot that uh, that happens in, in, in such collaborations. Okay, because I am almost out of my time, I, I will not go further into these uh, sort of over the topic of discussions of what all this means for the uh, uh, for the for the entire basin and so on so on so 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 I would just stop here because because really we are not stopping when the school is going on. We will have an excellent panel discussion uh, uh, this afternoon, rethinking about all of this. But at least for this part of the talk, I would say I will conclude that river basins. I hope that I have been able to convince you that that by itself, when it equipped with smart infrastructures, are very complex artificial. Uh, social systems, and this gives you a very unique setting in which to try out your ideas. For all the electrical engineers, for the scientists in, the, in this hall, there is a lot to look at. Okay. I hope I've been able to convince you of that. The water problems, therefore, can inspire any of ICT inspired systems engineering, informatics, and systems analysis like solutions. And the managing the irrigation networks in the Indus, this inspires interesting problems. <laughs> I mean, this is an important bullet because really it is a very important and unique social economic context for Pakistan. So, I mean, really the need is out there. People are crying for, 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 new, for new solutions. And uh, the water informatics is really the key to making these complex decision support systems. Because these gadgets are, uh, in some sense, a way to enable the, uh, the smart algorithms and data analytics which, uh, which, uh, uh, which other people have been doing. So, this is where I will stop uh, as far as this particular sort of uh, uh, overview of what this whole informatics area is. Uh, if uh, there are any questions or comments at this time, uh, I will be happy to, uh, to take and uh, otherwise we will move on.
Elena again. <laughs> so Elena is going to continue with her uh, lecture on uh, optimization and some topics.